Yes, it's time once again for our podcast with Sebastian Hummergain, the cricket reporter, and John Pike, the uh, columnist for Arab News. I'm Brian Murgatroyd, and uh, we've got plenty to chat about, particularly the latest on the ICC Cricket World Cup. We're going to uh, review the two semi-finals, look ahead to the final, and uh, there's a little bit of chat around one of the countries involved uh, or were involved in that tournament as well. So uh, let's reflect, first of all, on the fact that uh, India overcame New Zealand by 70 runs in Mumbai, while Australia overcame South Africa by three wickets in a titanic arm wrestle in Kolkata. We'll look back at those matches, look ahead to the final, which is due to take place in Ahmedabad. And we'll talk about the other major news to break over the past few days as a direct result of the events at the World Cup, with Baba Azam resigning as Pakistan captain in all three formats following his side's failure to reach the knockout stage. So let's get cracking then straight away. And first of all, we'll review that India against New Zealand match. A big win for India in the end. They made 397 for four, the highest total ever made in a Men's Cricket World Cup knockout match, with Virat Kohli scoring his 50th one-day international 100, passing Sachin Tendulkar's mark in that form of the game, while Shreyas Iyer scored a brutal 105 from 70 deliveries. And despite Daryl Mitchell's outstanding 134 in response, Mohamed Shami's 7 for 57, the best figures by an Indian bowler in World Cup history, ensured the hosts marched on in relative comfort. John... Holy Shreyas Iyer and Shami took the headlines, but was the match effectively won inside the first 10 overs, thanks to Shubman Gill and Rohit Sharma? They added 84 in that time, and you just got the feeling that New Zealand were on the back foot ever after. Well, as soon as I saw that India had won the toss, I sort of thought, game over. We've discussed New Zealand's bowling has not been as strong as, as in previous years. And they had to have a look at being more suited to New Zealand or, or English conditions than Indian. Uh, and it, it's turned out that way. They never really recovered, as you said, uh, despite showing their customary resilience to get within 70 runs. And the way that India played the top of the order, really quite reminiscent of how England used to play with, you know, with Roy and Bairstow and, and Alex Hales. Sebash, there was plenty of chat immediately before the match about the fact that uh, the game took place on a used pitch rather than a fresh surface. But did it prove to be a factor in the end? Uh, I wasn't sure that it did. Yeah, the decision came just one day before the match. That was more surprising. It was not mandatory to use the fresh surface, but uh, to have such a change just a day before, I think it will surely disturb the mental state away from the team. But uh, I think uh, ICC is in the representative approved the change and looking at the game it didn't have any effect in the numbers should have bothered QA's a bit before the game but we saw 700 odd ones and both teams had the chances in the game so in the end the change didn't advantage India like there were rumours but uh, the lead up I think it didn't look fair for the Kiwis. John talk to us about Virat Kohli it's his third hundred of the tournament he's now surpassed Sachin Tendulkar's record for most runs in a single edition of the Cricket World Cup, and he's now got 80 hundreds at international level. How good was this innings, and, and how well is he playing? That's 50 in 8 out of 10 innings in this tournament. He's clearly uh, a man at ease with life. It took a while, I think, to come to terms with the nasty business of the captaincy and, and the uh, relationship or non-relationship with Ganguly. I think once he's settled that down, he said publicly that he would concentrate on his batting. He's also redoubled his fitness regime and diet. I think he's now only 13 kg lighter than a few years ago. And the surprise is that he actually gets out. I mean, he is now 35 Celebrated the birthday of the century, November the 5th in Calcutta against South Africa. He's been playing ODI cricket, I forget, since 2008. We're talking about 15 years. Now, 279 innings, nearly 14,000 runs, an average of 58.7. That gets him, I think, third in the averages list, um, with Shubham Gill being second, interestingly. As you mentioned, only Sachin has scored more runs, over 18,000 but a lower average in a, in a different era. So Cole obviously playing exceptionally well, an adoring audience, both in the stadium and on social media, on a on a both a global and sort of a horrible word, global, but um, you know, playing in India on a global stage. And what's incredible also is that 
his reputation as a finisher is getting stronger. He averages 64 when India have been chasing. Personal mantra is you know, striving for better, and um, clearly he's doing that. Yes, Subhash, he's now 20 hundreds away from scoring 100 hundreds at international level. That's something only Sachin Tendulkar has done. Can he get there, do you think? Uh, Brian, if you asked me this question a few months ago, I'd say there's no chance, but the way he's rejuvenated his form, I say there's a chance of reaching 100 hundreds. Uh, he's been deemed the face of cricket when the game was induced in early 20 Olympics, which suggests he might be around the game for a few more years and he's proved that to be the main man in batting Indian batting lineup even today and he's got the numbers in recent years as well and to add up I think his great and determination or should I say his hunger to get those three figures is different to others and the celebration after every hundred seems like he's got the first one just now so I think I feel we'll see more of these hundreds from him. John, New Zealand had no answer to India's batting onslaught, especially against Kohli and Shreya Zaya. That pair added 163 in 21 overs. Is there anything they could have done differently? With the team they had on the field, probably not. They needed quality spin. They didn't play Sodi, but would he have made much difference? maybe marginal. I just think they were blitzed by the, the Indian juggernaut and Ken Williamson press conferences pretty well said that. And Subhash, when India bowled, Mohamed Shami continued his incredible form with those seven wickets. He's now the leading wicket taker in the tournament. Just talk to us about him. Brian, if you remember, I would said in our podcast that India should be playing Sami even before Hardik's injury paved the way. Sami showed the way why he is still the best seamer India has. I think... Uh, He's the leading wicket taker despite missing first few games and he's not just taking the wickets. I think he's unsettling the opposition batters. He's not just experimenting. He knows his uh, discipline bowling and that has ripped rewards. And I think semi-final game, same even wickets in a piece where two batters got centuries in the first inning. I think that's tremendous effort to get India back in the game and into the finals. And he could be the main man. India will look if they want to trouble the Australian batters in the final. And... For what he's gone through off the field, I think it's nice to see Sami perform and get back to his best. Yes, outstanding stuff from him. And outstanding too from Daryl Mitchell. John, it seems unfair that he had to end up on the losing side, but his innings was still one that should be spoken about for years to come. It was his second hundred of the tournament against India. In fact, he's the only player to reach three figures against them. How well did he play? Well, superbly. He's a great competitor. Superb innings, but you know, all too much to ask, even with uh, somebody with um, with his ability and temperament. Whenever I watch New Zealand, whenever he comes out to bat, I think there's a, there's an air of of expectancy uh, about what he will do. I think there's you know he, he uses class, he uses determination and and uh, and technical ability. But it was all rather too much on the day. Indeed, it was a brave effort by New Zealand, but another semi-final loss for them, their seventh, while India march on to their fourth final, following on from 1983, 2003 and 2011. On now to South Africa versus Australia, the second semi-final, and that was a complete contrast with the first. It was a real contest between bat and ball, with both spinners and seamers enjoying the conditions. Josh Hazelwood was once again outstanding for Australia. He's been superb in the tournament for them. Two for 12 for him. Mitchell Stark was excellent as well. He took three for 34. They helped reduce South Africa to 24 for four before David Miller's sixth one-day international 100 helped the Proteas reach 212, and that turned out to be just within Australia's range. Australia got away to a flying start, thanks to David Warner and Travis Head, and although South Africa's spinners, Tabre Shamsi and uh, Kishav Maharaj, bowled superbly, they took three for 66 between them in their 20 overs. Australia scrambled over the line, thanks to Steve Smith, Josh Inglis, uh, Mitchell Stark and Captain Pat Cummins. John, South Africa will rue the start they made with the bat, 24 for four, as we've mentioned. It was always going to be an uphill battle for them to get into the match after that. So did they make a mistake by uh, deciding to bat first when Temba Bavuma won the toss? Not necessarily. We've talked about South Africa as, as, as chasers and they're conscious that they are better batting first. And I think they would have reasoned 
uh, as we've done on, on this podcast, that the Australian attack hasn't been firing on all cylinders in the tournament. But on this particular day, the engine was well-tuned um, for that uh, for that match. I think more of a concern is is for South Africa was, was Bavuma's own form with the bats, and he, he failed again, and haven't really got um, some of the starts I would have wanted, despite you know, de Kock's fine form earlier. And it's always difficult to recover from 24 for four, although, as you said, they nearly did. Indeed, Josh Hazelwood, superb again for Australia. Just talk to us, Sebash, about his excellence and the fact uh, Mitchell Stark was also back to somewhere near his best. I think uh, Hazelwood and Stark both were immense in the first power play and credits where it's due to Skipper Cummins. I think he decided to bowl both Stark and Hazelwood beyond the first power play and both cut big wickets in the sixth over to reduce South Africa to 24 for four. And talking about Hazelwood, I think uh, he's not just about the wickets, his economy of around four and a half a strike baller who's opening the bowling and in the death over is going under five and in tournament that has seen 300 plus scores in the majority of the games I think that's commendable effort from Hazelwood uh, he's gone wicketless just twice in this tournament and even on those w- wicketless games uh, he has had tight spells and you can't ask much from a seamer who's playing every game and Stark I think he gave us a glimpse of that 2019 World Cup version and Australia would love to see this partnership repeat against Rohit and Gil in the finals. Absolutely. Now, we've spoken already about Daryl Mitchell and how unfortunate it was that he was on the losing side after his brilliant 100. Well, the same is true of David Miller. He made an outstanding 101 to, to haul South Africa back from that desperate position they were in at the start of their innings. And interestingly enough, he was one of the few players in this tournament to collar Adam Zampa. Just wondering if India will uh, have a look at that and uh, take a few lessons from it moving into the final. But David Miller, a great effort from him from that situation that South Africa found themselves in, John. He will surely feel that he didn't deserve to be on a losing side. As you mentioned, he hauled uh, them back into contention. Almost a total that... uh was uh, competitive enough for, uh, for Australia. And he, he seemed to be in a different class against the spinners. But again, not quite enough. Sebash chasing 213 to win. How crucial was it for Australia in the final analysis that they got that start from Warner and Head rattling along at 10 and over in the first uh, six overs? It just took scoreboard pressure completely out of the equation, didn't it? Yeah, I think they did what South Africa failed to do in the first innings. Uh, the start uh, that they had gave us Australia mental is in the series and it is going to be tough batting second late on and we saw why uh, the middle order struggled as well. So Head and Warner attacked early and they didn't just reduce the margin but help uh, unsettle the strike ballers as well. And when you've got 212 to defend and best ballers are getting attacked, there will be enforced changes. South Africa came back with the spin of Marker, Samsi and Maharaj but I think head inning was the difference because the run that they put on early I think Australia had just kept on the chase just Martin and I think at the end played their overs and got to the win Sebastian, I'll ask you this as well Australia into the final but surely they'll reflect upon some of the shots their batters played Steve Smith Marnus Labashain in particular they made it harder for themselves perhaps than they needed to yeah, I think uh... They should have just stayed and I, the the way they had the start, I think uh, they got carried away. And the nature of Smith and Lavosan, I think they're the last ones to expect that. Uh, just uh, wrong shots in wrong position, I think. They had just uh, waited on and uh, was the spinners away, I think they would have been home. But with the selection dilemma, I think uh, St- Smith and Lavosans are under fire and they've not got big scores in late, these late games. So uh, a tough pressure for them. I think final, I think we'll... We may see or one of these going out if uh, Greener, uh, let's say, Stoinis comes in to make up that bowling attack. So tough job ahead. Uh, and Smith and Lovson, I think before the tournament, we'd expect to see them fighting ahead for uh, the middle order, but they have not quite done that. And yesterday was just Smith had a good start. He could have uh, got the Australian team home, but he failed to do that. John, it's more semi final heartache for South Africa fourth time they've lost at this stage of a men's cricket world cup and the quest for their cricketing holy grail will go on for at least another four years is it another missed opportunity or or is there mitigation in this failure i think there's there's mitigation they've um i mentioned before about bavuma's own form at the, at the top of the order he was injured of course 
Um, I think it's something they have to address. They've got all around strength. They're going to be, um, of course, without to cog for the future. They've got a bit of rebuilding to do. And, of course, they uh, they seem to be focusing a lot on, on T20 cricket. Aren't going to spend too much test match cricket. I think they got as far as, as um, certainly as far as, I mean, even further than I would have expected them to. Um, there's something to build on. But uh, I think there's some serious, uh, serious thinking to do uh, how they maximise the abilities that they have got. So the final will be between India, the hosts and twice the champions in 1983 and 2011 and five times winners Australia, who've previously lifted the title in 1987. That was on the Indian subcontinent, 1999, 2003, 2007 and 2015. Let's look ahead now to the final to be played in Ahmedabad in front of, uh, well, well in excess of 100,000 spectators. John, India are unbeaten, played 10, won 10, and they've played like champions so far. Can you detect any weaknesses that will give Australia grounds for optimism? Well, if there are any weaknesses, they aren't very visible and they're very, very well hidden. As I mentioned on previous podcasts, when I arrived in India, the early stage of the tournament, I felt that uh, everything was geared to an Indian victory. It feels um, feels like a procession and a coronation march, and it and there hasn't been much to, to detract from that that particular view. Again, as I was mentioned previously, if there was any team, in my view, that was going to give them a proper run for the money, it uh, it would be Australia, and so it's going to prove. And I think a word uh, about Pat Cummings. You know, this is a captain, quick bowler. Australia don't normally go for captains, quick bowlers. He's had his critics. But uh, since June, World Test Championship, shared ashes, now the final of a World Cup. Um, I think um, there's a big, big green caps off to uh, to Pat Cummings for the way that he's, uh, he's handled the team and, as, and uh, for his role in bringing them round from a pretty ragged position early in this tournament. Yes, he certainly has lifted them up by their uh, bootstraps, no question about that. Sebastian, though, with the way Rohit Sharma is taking the game away from sides in the first power play, Pat Cummings' opposite number, could this match actually be won and lost in the first 10 overs if he gets going? Well, I doubt Australia will give him space like the Kiwi bowlers did. Uh, bowling short balls to Rohit in power play is asking to get punished. And even though they might have a plan on that, plan on that the margin of error from Rohit is very minimal. And most of the times, even though he miscues one, his job would already be done. And Rohit's fiery start making things easy for Gil and others to build up on that after and if his run flurry doesn't end soon, I think India will be on top and Mammoth total against Australia won't be far away. So Stark and Hazelwood, I think they've got a big job in their hands and they've been troubling Rohit Sarma. But it's the final. It's in Ahmedabad and thousands and thousands of people will be there. So I think Rohit Sarma would love to score one, but it's not easy as it has been. John, what about the fact that India have relied on five frontline bowlers to power their progress? Yes, there were some part-timers who had a bowl against the Netherlands, but primarily it's the five of Jaspreet Bumra, Mohamed Siraj, Mohamed Shami, Ravindra Jadeja and uh, Kuldeep Yadav, who've done all the heavy lifting. How good have they been individually and collectively? And, and can any of them be got at by Australia? Well, Shami is uh, clearly the, uh, the star of the show at the moment, as uh, Subhash has mentioned. 23 wickets at 9.13, which is just uh, extraordinary. Jadeja's got 16 wickets at 22. Bumra, 18 at 18. Siraj, 13 at 33, which is um, not quite up with the others. And yet are 15 at 25. Who would Australia target? I don't think they target anybody. I think they just have to be aggressive uh, and not rash. And as uh, Subhash has indicated, I would imagine that the first 10 overs of, uh, of each of the innings is going, to, uh, is going to be a great determining factor in the outcome. Subhash, India have coped comfortably with the pressure of being hosts and favourites thus far. 
with the realization they're so close to glory, can they maintain that relaxed and so far successful mindset, do you think? I think they can because India have not just won 10 on the trot. They've glided past the opponents. Uh, they're in top form without a doubt. And it was Australia that gave close to giving them a challenge in the late stage. But I think that Kohli's dropped cats proved decisive and uh, Australia have come back from that situation as well and India at the moment are not just performing in the pitch but the dressing room environment is great too we've seen bits in social media the environment inside the dressing room is amazing they're having fun on the pitch and off it as well and that helps bring out their best uh, you can take an example of Isan Kisan so he could have walked away into any batting lineup in this World Cup but he's happy sitting outside uh, getting these drinks uh, coming up and fielding uh, they've sorted upper middle order but the only issue that India would be tested is I think their lower middle order they have not got chance to finish any game it would be a question but uh, apart from that I think India is a step ahead they're playing the finals in 130k or Ahmedabad and we may see the repeat of 2011 for what's in the stake for Virat Kohli, Rohit Sarma and their generation. John, let's talk about Australia now that's eight wins in a row that's success in the semi-final against uh, South Africa it's an incredible turnaround for them really isn't it after they they lost their opening two matches against India and South Africa in the group stage, and they've secured several of those eight wins despite not being at their best with individuals standing up to bail them out of trouble. How have they achieved something that, let's be honest, seemed impossible or near impossible a month ago? I'd imagine there's been some pretty straight talking. They were rusty, even tired, and they've Several of them continued looking a bit tired uh, in, in uh, recent matches. But uh, unlike England, they regrouped and got better and better. I don't think everything's still in place. We've talked about the issue in the middle order, whether that will come home in the final. We'll have to wait and see on the final selection. And of course, there's the issue of, uh, of temperament. How are they going to be faced? How are they going to cope with being faced with a, a sea of expectant blue shirts, all, you know, 100,000 or so of them? But... If anyone can challenge India, they can. Sebash, does the Australian bowling, Hazelwood and Zampa apart, convince you they can cause damage to the Indian top order? Is that surely one place where the match could be won and lost? Uh, they did have India, if you remember, two runs for three wickets in that earlier meeting in Chennai. Yeah, Brian, as I've mentioned, uh, that game, I think uh, Kohli's dropped catch was the real decider. Uh, India could have been in a big, big trouble if Kohli was out there. And uh, Hazelud and Zamba, I think Australia's bowling has been dependent on them for wickets as well as getting the runs uh, stopped. But in semi, I think... Uh, Travis Hitt's uh, spell was a real decider. He got the much-needed wicket, that breakthrough. But in the finals, I think without Stoney and Green, Maxwell is favourite to fulfil that fifth ball or quota. And if someone like Zampa, uh, we saw in the semi-finals get uh, punished, they, they have option. Mars is also an option to get that. But I think all depends on how good start they will get in the first 10. And Stark and Hazel would have one job remaining is to get through that power play, maybe get a wicket of Rohit Sarma. That would be amazing for them. But uh, Cummins, I think, is yet to have a big say in this tournament. He was there in the opposite end in Maxwell's innings, but with the ball, I think, is yet to get a big game and we might see a captain's charisma in the final. John Manus Labashain was uh, preferred to Marcus Stoinis in the semi-final. He'll be disappointed with the way that he got out as will uh, Steve Smith as well. Do you expect Labashain and indeed Smith to retain their places in the final, especially, uh, of course, they offer a great deal in the field, Labashain and Smith. Do you think Australia, on the other hand, might look at Stoinis's more explosive potential with the bat and his medium paces as a better option? And there's Green as well, of course, Cameron Green. Let's not forget him. Yeah, I don't think Green's going to get in. He's a shadow of himself at the moment. It's a tough one between Stoinis and, and Labuschagne. They seem to have gone with with Marnus. Didn't do himself any favours in the previous match. I suspect they're probably going to with him is probably a better bet against India's attack. And Subhash, we, we've already spoken about Rohit Sharma as a key player for India to set the tone when they bat. How crucial could David Warner and Travis Head be in the same way for Australia to put India's bowlers under pressure? We saw them do that against South Africa in the semi-final and, and it paid rich dividends. Uh, Head and Warner, I think Warner especially loves playing in India and between these supporters is loved by them too. But the, the final, it will be different. The crowd will be against him and he's a big game player. Head uh, has been outstanding since he's come to open the innings and even in the semi-finals, they were the difference in Australia's win. And if these two falter, 
I think the rebuild along the with getting rounds for Australia will be a tough one the way the middle order has been performing in recent games and talking about India's bowling I think uh, they start with Siraj and Bumrah but if things don't look right they can move to Sami as well we've seen three ball in the first 10 overs something that other teams really do so uh, I think uh, Warner and Head will try to get over with uh, target Siraj who's not been in top form lately but it's the crowd and the pressure if they can handle it I think uh, Indian bowlers will not be a big tough for them. Prediction time now, gentlemen. Which team will win and why? Subash, first of all? I'm going with Australia. I think uh, oh. they've been tested. They've, they've got gone over the line in these big match situations. In tough situations like uh, South Africa, like Afghanistan game, they have individuals who can do it for them. India, they have their star of their own, but I think the final is a different game and Australia know how to win these finals. John, what do you think? Well, I wasn't expecting that from Subash. I was going to say only a fool would not say India, but uh, maybe I have to choose my words more carefully now. Um, <laughs> as you will recall, Brian, um, at the start of the tournament, I went with a left field early prediction of Australia. I think um, to a degree of surprise from yourself, saying, uh, why? How do you come to that conclusion? And here we are. I have to say that I... That, when saying that, I didn't realise just how good India were going to be. And, and they, they really are one of the great ODO sides of, uh, of all time. And uh, it would, I say, it'd be a fool to bet against them. It would be a surprise for Australia to, uh, to win, I think. But I have to stick with my early prediction. So it's quite amazing that both of us uh, would say Australia. So um, I, I'm, I, in, if that's going to be the case, I can only say that I'd be very pleased not to be in India if that comes around. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, given that you two have gone for uh, Australia, I'll uh, jump on the other side of the fence. I'll go with India. They've been absolutely outstanding so far. What's really impressed me has been the way that they've actually ridden the wave of euphoria of the country rather than be be buried in the expectation that's been created. And uh, the way they're playing, the freedom with which they're playing, the smiles on their faces... I just think that uh, they're going to have just that little bit too much for Australia on the day. But we shall see uh, the final in Ahmedabad on Sunday. One other major news line since our previous podcast has been Babar Azam stepping down as Pakistan captain in all three formats after his side's failure to reach the last four of the Cricket World Cup. There's been quite a bit of interest in this because while Barber says he's resigned, Pakistan Cricket Board put out a media release saying they wanted Barber to stand down from the captaincy in the white ball formats. That's one day internationals and 2020 internationals. But they wanted him to stay on as test captain, something Barber declined after consulting with his family. Barber made 320 runs at an average of 40 during the tournament with a strike rate of 82.9. Steady figures, but nothing spectacular and no hundreds too. John, is Barber's uh, demotion, resignation, however you want to put it, is it a surprise? I don't think it is. The only element of surprise was that Mickey Arthur had said that um, uh, Baba needs to be taken on a, on a journey with the captaincy, which um, sort of suggested that, uh, that Arthur was really banking on him continuing as captain. So it does appear as if there have been um, some moves behind the scenes to uh, demote Baba. I guess his form has dipped. As you mentioned, his performance in the World Cup was nothing special for a man with his talents. I suspect it might just come of a bit of a welcome relief for, for the man himself. It's a heavy burden to carry, both being captain of, of Pakistan and also being able to perform to the best of his abilities. Sebash, isn't the truth really that Baba was handicapped more than anything else in the Cricket World Cup by the absence of uh, Nazim Shah? And had Nazim been fit, we could well have been looking at a totally different outcome. I think Pakistan missed out semi-finals by slim margin. Uh, if one of those tight games... Uh... When their way, I think the story would have been different. And Nasim Shah, I think he was certainly a big miss sign. And Nasim's partnership would have been great for Pakistan, especially at the start. And Babar was also out of date with the squad selection. They tried and tested, but didn't get much performance from other players as well. Uh, it's pity that he's resigned, but I think uh, it's not what 
as it looks. Uh, you don't get two new captains within two hours of resignation from the last one. Yes, uh, this, as you mentioned there, Sebash, uh, the Pakistan Cricket Board have been very quick off the mark. John, uh, Shan Masood's been named as Test Captain, Shaheen Shah Afridi as 2020 International Captain with the, the T20 World Cup in the Caribbean and the USA next year on the radar already. What do you make of those appointments? Well, Shah Masood is another of uh, Mickey Arthur's sort of protégés. He took him to Derbyshire and uh, it did well with Derbyshire. And then there's the sort of surprise move to, uh, to Yorkshire as captain. He's pretty untried, both internationally and uh, and as a leader. So that's, um, that's a rather... I think a bit of a left field move. A three D T twenty, I think, makes makes a lot of sense for the tournament next year. He seems to have been um, not quite uh, himself. Not sure about the dressing room harmony under uh, Bar Azam. So uh, I think uh, for the T twenty, yes. The other one with Shah Masood looks um, pretty risky to me. Yes, it's an interesting call that uh, both those players have been moved into position very very quickly indeed. Sebash. Do you actually think, as, as John alluded to a bit earlier, that uh, Barber stepping down as captain or, or resigning or being sacked, however you want to, to phrase it, it, could it actually be a good thing for Pakistan cricket? It, it'll free up their best batter, surely, from responsibility and allow him to return to his best form. In a way, it's nice for Barber, the batter, to get freed up. I think uh, uh, he'll get... A bit of freedom, but I don't think that really had effect on his game recently. He's a proper leader and I think that uh, has never hampered his performance. Uh, the thing now is he'll have two new captains and he needs to gel into a bit new environment with him being out of captaincy. And he has numbers with the bat. Uh, hopefully he'll better those numbers now. But uh, will the new leaders be able to get that reser desired results for the team? Because after all, the captaincy has been changed to get the better results. Uh, Babar may get uh, better numbers with the bat, but will the team get the desired results? Yes, that's the $64 million question. And I guess we'll find out as uh, time goes on. So there you have it. Next up is the Men's Cricket World Cup final. And I'm sure you're looking forward to it as much as we are here at The Wicket. We'll be back with all the wash-up from that final in our next episode, as well as more cricket chat from the Gulf region, Asia and worldwide. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment on what you've heard wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd love to hear your feedback. Let us know, too, if there's anything you'd like us to feature in future episodes. For now, though, this is Brian Murgatroyd, along with John Pike and Sebastian Hamagain, saying thank you for listening. And we look forward to your company next time.